I'm a little confused as to how to respond to others during this retreat. I understand the noble silence, don't say anything. But what about the 90% of communication that is non-verbal? Should we smile and make eye contact? Should we try to be aware and compassionate to each other? Or should we mind our own doings only and allow others the privacy to do the same? Well, I think the um, best thing to do is to do it the way you feel is most conducive to your concentration. And now if somebody makes eye contact with you and smiles at you, it's very difficult not to smile back. But I would say um, don't initiate. If it is happening, well, maybe you feel like responding but it's entirely up to you. When one is overcome by joy, how can one use this to lead to insight? What else is needed? Well, that depends what kind of joy that is. Is it worldly joy or meditative joy? Or is it joy from insight? Apparently it's not the latter. It's not joy from insight. So is it worldly joy? because the surroundings are nice and everything is going well? Or is it meditative joy? Now, if I assume that it's meditative joy, and I'm only assuming, it doesn't say so, and if that is the, the case, then it's the second meditative absorption and the insight that arises from that without a shadow of a doubt, if one takes a look at it, is that what one has been looking for in the world lives inside of oneself anyway. And there's no need to look any further other than getting inside. I presume that that's a question. Would you comment on feeling the water element during meditation? I have difficulty feeling it throughout my body and feel it more specifically as saliva and tears. Yes, I would say so. That's what we can feel. The water element does have, as its characteristic, also the binding. It's a binding element. If you have um, flour, you put water in, you get dough. So it's a binding of all these separate bits and pieces that we consist of. But that we can't feel. But what we can feel is another characteristic of the water element, that's a heaviness. It's the heaviest thing there is. So we feel heavy with the water element. But the most pronounced is, of course, saliva and tears and possibly perspiration. We can also feel the blood pulsing through the body. It's also water element. I was so looking forward to the noble silence of the retreat, but find that I'm talking to myself so much. <laughs> I think you've struck a sympathetic chord there. <laughs> I might as well be talking to others. <laughs> the internal chatter is about things like teachings to remember, to tell my husband who couldn't come, or imagine, imagined life stories of other retreatants <laughs> and the like. What is the antidote? <laughs> well, the longer, the longer the retreat goes on, usually, the more one has come away from the worldly situation, the easier it becomes for the mind to uh, quieten down. In fact, if one does a very, very long retreat, which this one isn't, the mind usually, eventually, says, oh, well, all right, then I'll be quiet if you, want, if you insist. And it does become quiet. Now, it depends very much how much one is usually mindful of what is going on in the mind. If that is not usually the case, and this is happening here, 
then all this chatter is quite shattering. But if one is usually aware of what the mind does, that's what usually happens. The mind is like an uninterrupted radio station. It just keeps talking. So you can do, well, first of all, you have to uh, accept that. That's what the human mind's all about. The second thing one can do is to label. Now that has been done here with two or three labels. But the labels that have been used here are not extremely effective because it's about telling the husband, remembering the teaching and making up stories about other retreatants. These are labels, quite so but not effective enough to stop one because they're quite interesting to make up stories about the other retreatants. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it's at least the mind gets something to be interested in. <laughs> what one should label in the first place is future. The husband obviously isn't here, so one has to tell him in the future, which gives a direct in, uh, in um, direct uh, experience that one isn't in the present, one's in the future. And making up life stories about retreatants, fantasy. So if we tell ourselves future and fantasy or remembering teaching is past, it is a little more effective than these labels because we realize we are not where we actually are. We're not in the present. And we're not experiencing the present as it is, but are fantasizing. So that could be helpful. The other thing is a little more determination. A little more determination to be mindful outside of the meditation sessions. Mindful of the body watching each step, watching each movement, watching, being attentive to what's really happening. And then the mind starts talking again, telling the mind, come on, be quiet, I really want to be mindful. So mindfulness is the antidote. I needed to hear the Dukkha talk today. Thank you. So does my brother. <laughs> Our relationship is of Dukkha. I would like to present him your tape. What words would you suggest I use when I give him the tape? <laughs> I am afraid that this sounds very much as if the person who's writing it is angry at the brother. And therefore doesn't quite know what to say. Because if one isn't angry, one knows exactly what to say. So I would suggest, and if I'm guessing right, I would suggest to first get over the anger, no matter how much dukkha that relationship has. First get over being angry with the brother. See your own dukkha, have compassion with yourself, have compassion with the brother. Having got over the anger, then one can hand the other person the tape and say, it has helped me a lot. Maybe you like it too. Simple, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but don't be angry. <laughs> According to the teaching, if we take away our memory and sense impressions, what is left? Well, most likely a corpse, huh? I mean, how can we take that away? And who was teaching that? <laughs> I mean, obviously the Buddha had memory and the Buddha could see, hear, taste, touch, smell and think. So he had sense contact. That's total misunderstanding. I would suggest to the person who wrote that to think about it again and try once more. Can you talk a little about your teacher and why you choose to ordain? Do you think it is possible to practice wholeheartedly 
without becoming a monk or a nun? Well, it's possible. It's not quite as easy. It's possible. And in the Buddha's time it was often done. Whether it's being done today or not, unless one lives in a spiritual center where all the people who live there are completely engaged in spiritual practice, I would say that in ordinary everyday life it's very difficult. In a spiritual center, yes, uh, very possible and not so difficult. The difficulty arises because there are so many other duties. Bank accounts, insurance policies, cars, acquaintances, relatives, and no end to things which ought to be done. My teacher was called the Venerable Nyanarama Mahatera, Singhalese, uh, a monk at the um, Mitrigala Monastery, which is somewhere in the center of Sri Lanka, in the middle of a jungle, hard to get at. It was about 500 acres of jungle and full of monkeys. Not quite as full of monks, <laughs> but plenty of them there too and uh, became a monk, as is very often the case in, a in Asia, at a very young age, I believe it was 12 or 14, and he died at the age of 91 in 1992. And uh, he was, did not come out of the monastery, even at a younger age, he stayed there practically all the time and he was teaching mostly the monks. He also taught lay people that came there, but only superficially, because he considered it only useful if one took the teaching it, uh, successively and consequently in all the time. So the lay people that came there and brought the uh, uh, dana did get teaching when he was younger, but it was more like just giving a talk. Monks were constantly taught. I met him in uh, 1983, I think it was, and uh, immediately realized that it would be extremely helpful because he was very supportive. And he's the one that said to me, the jhanas are becoming or have become, I think it was, a lost art, go to the West and teach it. And uh, I hadn't, of course we needed a translator because he didn't speak English and my Singhalese is practically non-existent. And I thought he meant that I should go and teach. And I said, yes, but I am teaching. And he said, no, no, you teach the jhanas. And with that support, I was happy to do so. Before that, I didn't like to really come out with them and teach them in a very succinct and clear manner because there is so much, so much uh, contrariness about them and so many wrong ideas about them that they wind up in an argument. But, and I don't think arguments are helpful. So after that support, of course, I did exactly that. And the interesting aspect of that particular uh, part of my teaching is that unheard of numbers of Westerners, we would never have dreamt it, can do them. And even another aspect is that many, many meditators have done them accidentally and didn't know what they were doing because nobody mentioned it. So 
there are numbers, and I can't give an exact number, I really don't know, but surprisingly many, wherever, whether that's here or in Germany or Holland or Switzerland or England, makes no difference. Wherever we go, uh, I find that many of the meditators have already done them, know exactly what is being said, and have a breathe a sigh of relief that what they were doing was fine. And then there are many that can learn them as easy. It's a natural way for the human mind to go, and uh, everybody has access. And apparently it was a wish of my teacher that that lost art should be re-established and should no longer be lost. And so, of course, one can find it in the Buddhist um, discourses. It's quite well explained, but it does help to have it personally explained. He was a medit meditating monk who had been in the forest or the jungle in that case for 91, 50, 60, about 75 years. And uh, not that he was isolated, I mean there were other monks and there were visitors, but uh, he d did not have that kind of um, tendency to go out and teach. He sent his monks out to teach. He stayed there. So what I did was I couldn't of course live there because in a monastery nuns don't live in Sri Lanka. I v visited as often as I could and uh, was always received with a very warm welcome. I believe that I was the only nun that he was teaching. Not that he wouldn't have taught others, they just didn't come. And one of his books was translated into English. He wrote, I think, 35, but they're all in Singalese. And one was translated into English and uh, is available from the Buddhist Publication Society. And I went through that book minutely, word by word, and underlined each word that I didn't understand and had him explain it to me. And we did that for about, it must have been about two years, because I couldn't go there very often, because it took about five and a half to six hours to get there. So. Um, it took that long because I didn't go very often. But that book, it's very thin, it doesn't, uh, it's not a thick book, but it contains everything from our present state to Nibbana. So I feel fortunate to have had the personal explanation that I got, and if I didn't understand something, I just kept asking and asking. And the um, primary monk that was translating for me had been a professor of English at the Peradeniya University in Sri Lanka. So there was no chance of misunderstanding. His English, uh, Singhalese is his mother tongue, but English was perfect. He was a venerable Jnanananda who is well known for his book Concept and Reality. And uh, he was then, after the death of uh, Venom Nanarama, he became the abbot, but he left. He thought that was much too strenuous and demanding to be an abbot. So he went into a small uh, forest place where he could practice. Well, that's about all I can tell you about. Oops, Venom Nanarama. I have a, a book which was written on, for my 70th birthday where we translated his English book into German and it is part of this um, uh, remembrance for my 70th birthday and there's a photo of him in there but 
most of you wouldn't be able to read the German one. For the Dukkha contemplation, I selected my biggest, my biggest past Dukkha. My wife was killed suddenly in an accident in 1979. I did pretty well in the contemplation, but it happened 17 years ago, so that I had come to terms with my grief quite a while ago. If it were to happen now to my current wife, I would be able to handle it better, but I would still go through the shock of the event and my craving for her. I don't think I could avert the grieving process in such a situation. Uh, Most likely not. It's a natural uh, human way of dealing with loss. But if one wants to really um, go along on this path, one has to know one's attachments. And as one gets to know one's attachments, one also realizes that they are what keep us in samsara, the round of birth and death, and also keep us on the edge of our chairs hoping that that what we don't like won't happen. Fear. So if we want to get rid of fear, and if we want to get out of samsara, which that's a personal choice, we have to get rid of attachment. And as we get rid of attachment, it doesn't mean getting rid of people. It just means getting rid of the idea that we've got to have them. And as we get rid of the idea that we have to have certain people, we also get rid of the idea that they belong to us. And before we can do that, we might have to get rid of the idea that this body belongs to us. And that's already a wonderful, freeing experience. And if we have time during this course, we'll do a contemplation that may help us supposed to help us to see the fallacy of our view that this body anywhere in it anywhere at all says me or I it's got absolutely nothing to say about the whole matter it's all in our mind you mentioned another sweeping method related to the spine Could you please explain it briefly? Well, it just concerns the fact that one can go along um, the spine spot by spot, down and up and out through the top and just use the spine as a primary subject. I can't do it briefly. (laughs) When I do body sweeping, I first feel I'm pointing, pointing at different points in my body and watching, feeling them. After a while, I feel I'm inside the points and experiencing the softness, hardness, etc. Then I feel expansion and lightness, but also I lose my concentration. If the concentration on the body parts is lost, instead the concentration should be on either the expansion or the lightness, whichever one is stronger. If the lightness is strong, as opposed to heaviness, then that is the meditation subject and leads to the first meditative absorption, staying on it. The feeling of lightness is a totally different feeling from what we usually have in our body. It can result in a feeling of floating. It can result in a feeling of, in its expansion, of the dissolving of the outer limits of the body. Whatever. The first meditative absorption is connected to the lightful sensation. So if the sweeping brings that about, then it's quite all right to go to that and stay with it. 
However, it's still very practical and it's um, also very useful to at least once a day go through the whole body with the sweeping. It's an exercise which helps us to concentrate, it's cleansing, and it also comes in very, very useful for pains or discomfort. So it should at least be used once a day. But if this is the way to get into the meditative absorption, use it and be grateful you found an entry. Another spiritual path I know about does more chanting than meditation. They say it gives better meditation. What's the purpose of chanting in Theravada? The purpose of chanting in Theravada is reverence and respect for Buddha Dhamma Sangha and also learning some of the teaching by heart. If you chant long enough, you can't help but know it by heart. And if you then don't do it parrot-like, which also happens, but do it with knowing each word you're saying, then you've learned some of the suttas by heart. So the usefulness is there. But it's certainly not considered to be more useful than meditation, so that there's more chanting than meditation other way around. Can you talk about the past moments and what they mean? How do the absorption states lead to them? I think we'll talk about the absorption states first, tomorrow, and then see if we have a time to talk about past moments. I think it would be not very clear and also um, not in proper sequence. In regard to sweeping, does the nausea, slight dizziness of cleansing, happen right then, or can it happen up to 30 minutes later? Yes, it certainly can. It can happen later. It's not common, it's unusual, but it certainly can happen later. And if it does, go to the point where the unpleasant feeling has arisen, and go out through the skin at that spot and do it more than once if necessary. Five times, six times, doesn't matter. So it's an unusual happening, but it certainly can happen. Would you say more about the value of silence when on retreat? Well, we just heard one question about silence, outer silence, but no inner silence. But hopefully, <coughs> the outer silence will generate inner silence. At least, even in this case where we heard that there was incessant chatter, at least one knows what one is doing, chattering to oneself. Usually, when we talk to each other, we are not aware of the fact that this is one of our very beloved escape mechanisms from Dukkha. Talking to somebody else also is a support system for the me. Obviously, we talk to ourselves for the same reason. But when we do that and have the outer silence, we, it is much easier and much quicker to recognize that. In everyday life, it's impossible to recognize. Everybody talks. So how can we avoid it? But here, we can. So that very important aspect of an uh, intensive meditation retreat, so that we get to recognize Maybe we aren't silent, maybe we're chattering inside, but the recognition can happen. Do you know 
if the following passage has any scriptural reference? If so, where can it be found? Sow a thought and reap a deed. Sow a deed and reap a habit. Sow a habit and reap a character. Sow a character and reap a destiny. It's a very nice saying, but it's not from the Buddha. And I don't know where it can be found. It's definitely not from the Buddha. Particularly the word destiny already tells on that. If we are each the cause of our own suffering, who is responsible for the suffering of the Holocaust? The Germans who perpetrated violence or the Jews who, from a Buddhist perspective, it would seem, simply allowed themselves to be miserable? And no. The perspective that is being uh, used here is certainly not a Buddhist perspective. This perspective is the ordinary, everyday kind of perspective. The, um, when we are the cause of our own suffering, that means karma. Karma is the uh, law of um, cause and result. So the causes that we put into the stream of life bring results. Whether they bring them in this life or in lives to come, we can't say. If they are small, and most of the causes which we originate are very small, and they fruit practically immediately. They are like the seeds of carrots. If you sow carrot seeds, you very soon have carrots. You don't have to wait long. But if you sow a, <clears throat> sow a seed of an oak tree, maybe your great-great-grandchildren might have some shade from that oak tree. So the small things which we do every day from morning to night, namely our thoughts, have immediate results. The big things take longer. So the perpetrators of an unwholesome deed are making karma. So they are certainly responsible for that karma they are making. And therefore, they need a lot of compassion. And those people who are the victims at this time are reaping some karma that has been made, maybe, hundreds and thousands of years ago. We don't know. And it doesn't pay to inquire. There's a constant interchange of the perpetrator and the victim. The victim was the perpetrator, the perpetrator will be the victim, and so on. All you have to do is read the daily newspapers. It's happening constantly. So it isn't at all useful to point one's finger at those that are doing the unwholesome act. It's only useful to have great compassion. Sometimes when, I, when doing metta, I begin to weep with sadness. Is it because the compassion that arises is too difficult to handle. And no, I wouldn't think so. I would, more, would be more inclined to think that if one starts weeping in the metta meditation, I presume that's what's meant, that there are, there's first of all, one thing, the sadness that arises is due to the fact that one hasn't always been doing this. That's very common. And the other sadness that arises is self-pity. Because the love for oneself is probably not developed yet. And so loving is imbued with wanting to be loved. The purer the loving becomes, 
the less sadness. It's just an impurity which is still in there. I was driving down a small road and a car pulled out of a parking lot. I hit the brakes and my reaction was anger. As I sat there, I realized that under the anger was fear. Is there something under fear or is it fear or is fear at the bottom of emotion? It's fear of death. It's craving to be. And uh, we will do contemplation on our own death. We haven't quite got around to that yet. We will. The longer you're here, the easier it becomes to do that. So it's not a good thing to do right away. Uh, Fear of not being, which is the craving to be, is the manifestation of our delusion that we're actually somebody separate. And naturally we don't want anybody to hit us with that car because that could be the end of us being here. And fear often turns into anger, um, even into aggression, because it's all that one same fear of uh, being annihilated and the fear of annihilation does turn into aggression. Do you have any suggestions for dealing with worry and tension in daily life? For example, about a project at work or an upcoming exam. Yeah, that's a very common problem, isn't it? Um, To have worry and tension about the result. It's really quite easy. Stop thinking about the result and just do the best you can. A very easy sentence. It has to be practiced. The results take care of themselves. Doing the best we can is what we can do. But if we actually think all the time while we're doing it that we must have a certain result, we can't do our best. Our mind is at least divided. Divided into doing and divided into hoping to get the desired result. The same with meditation. If you expect results, the mind is divided and meditation won't happen. The way it happens is when we do our best and that's it. No results, no achievements. Just doing. It's the same with this. Same with exams and same with um, projects. It helps a lot if one loves what one is doing. If one can actually have an open heart for the meditation, for the project, I don't know whether one can love exams. I'm not sure about that. (laughs) I haven't had any in a long time. But if one can love the project or love the meditation, then there's no question what one does with it. One does one's best. And doing one's best is already the reward because it brings happiness. One loses oneself in doing one's best. And as soon as we lose our self-concern is happiness. I'm doing the body sweep. May one start at the feet and proceed to the crown? This way is more familiar to me. I don't teach it that way. I feel that this particular cleansing um, and um, feeling and sensation method should be done from the top to the bottom. I know it's being taught from the bottom to the top, but uh, a lot of things are being taught that I don't teach. So, um, it's just like when we go in a shower, we don't start at the feet. (laughs) 
So that's it. <laughs> Same thing. Hmm? My concentration has been good these past several days, but thoughts are arriving with greater frequency now. At first I felt bothered by all these manifestations of me, and I craved to be rid of them all at once. Such a profound act of relinquishment seemed beyond my abilities, and obviously this desire was one born of both laziness and greed. Now it occurs to me I'm blessed with so many opportunities to practice letting go. I believe this will lead me to an understanding of the word practice. Any comments, corrections, or encouragement? Keep going. <laughs> Um, the craving to be rid of me is of course a craving that only totally subsides when me has totally subsided but it should give rise to what we call some vega in Pali which is urgency the urgency of practice so that it becomes a priority in one's life. Everything else needs to be done too. Obviously, we have to uh, comply with our responsibilities and everybody has things that need to be done, but we can set priorities. And if we have the priority of the spiritual practice, because we know that if we do it consistently, and in, in a way that we have learned that eventually it will rid us of the one troublemaker there is in this world. There's only one, and that's called me. Of course, it's multiplied by six billion, but it's always called the same thing. It's always called me. So if we really know that, then that priority system is unshaken always. It doesn't mean that we sit in meditation from morning to night. That happens in an intensive meditation retreat that we do more meditation. But it is the, also the um, driving force behind whom we associate with, uh, how we structure our daily lives, the things we talk about, the things we think about, things that we might read. It's a, the, the clear-cut trigger behind everything we do. So if there is a real feeling that me is, is the one that's making trouble, the urgency of practice should be at the apex of all our activity. I don't think that one could say, at least I'm not uh, really familiar with that kind of feeling, that the desire to get rid of me is born of laziness. It's very difficult to get rid of me. It takes an awful lot of doing. And uh, a lazy person is never going to make it. A lazy person is going to hang on to me for many lifetimes to come. Uh, greed, yes, it's craving. but we usually say we have that craving in order to get rid of all cravings. So, in other words, that's the way to go. That's the one that we retain because it's the one that will eventually bring about the results. I'm blessed with something. I believe this will lead me to an understanding of the word practice. Yes, the word practice means from morning to night. It means having the spiritual aspect of one's own person always in front and not forgetting. It's not easy to do in the marketplace where so many other things hit the consciousness but if one takes a little more time than one usually does 
just slows down a bit with one's reactions and with one's impulsive behavior and just watches with mindfulness, then it's quite possible to practice all day long. And what do we practice? Purification. And how do we practice purification? Through mindfulness and through, with mindfulness, the substitution of the unwholesome with the wholesome. So that practice can happen anywhere, anywhere at all. And it doesn't matter what one does, doesn't matter what kind of um, commitments one has, doesn't matter I hope you're not very tired. (laughs) There are an awful lot of questions here. (laughs) If it starts getting late, I'll make it short. Is a factor of enlightenment energy the same as effort in the Noble Eightfold Path? Um, It's related. It's not exactly the same, it's a different word. Energy is virya and the factor of effort in the Noble Eightfold Path is Vayama, Sama Vayama, right effort. It reappears, energy reappears in the uh, four Idipadas, which are roads to power and which are also four of the 37 factors of enlightenment. And there it's called concentration of energy. So it is related to effort, but it isn't exactly the same thing, but two different words, and it is something that is appearing twice in the factors of enlightenment. If one has firmly grasped the key, unlocked the door, and managed to keep the door open, such that access to the first jhana can be made with relative ease, What practice do you suggest at that point? Do you, for instance, recommend continued sweeping? Is one dependent on your next English course to avoid being stuck (laughs) in delight or joy? Well, I certainly don't recommend being stuck in delight or joy. Um, Well, first of all, I recommend a bit of own initiative and not expecting to be spoon-fed. And this does appear uh, in several of the questions. Please use your own inventiveness and your own wisdom. Everybody's got it. The second thing is that we will discuss third and fourth jhana Um, day after tomorrow. They are available in the book When the Iron Eagle Flies. They are available in many of my tapes which are listed on the tape list. I am available. Nowadays this little um, planet of ours has shrunk and fax from California to Germany takes I think something like two minutes or three, and uh, phone, same length of time. And then remains the question whether you can actually continue getting into the jhanas when you're at home. One would hope so, but it's certainly not a sure thing. It, uh, It is something that needs to be worked at. It's much easier here, particularly if one keeps quiet outside of the meditation and practices mindfulness. Now just imagine the difference in your daily activity that you have here at this time and that you will have as of next week. And then keep the jhanas going. A stuck is um, up put in parentheses, so it's not seriously meant, I think. 
So all these factors come together and if you can keep it going and can get on with it, that will be very nice. It's not guaranteed. It occurs to me that there is immense power and creativity in the energy build-up that the practice you teach produces. Um, what is your view of the Buddha's teaching regarding the opportunity or responsibility to use this energy in the world? One can't help it. If there is energy, if there is strength, if there is power, it transmits to everything around one. It emanates. It certainly brings results. It's just a question. How much insight has arisen in order to use that energy, that strength, productively and in a way which is to the benefit of many? You can't help but use it. Whatever is there, that comes out. In Sunday's question and answer session, the morning one, someone asked you to say a bit about Mudita since you touched on the other Brahma Viharas. Those of us in the retreat missed your answer. Could you speak about sympathetic joy? The uh, far enemy is envy and the near enemy is pretense. And it is a necessary quality to practice because there isn't enough joy in the world. And if we only rely on the things that please us personally, there isn't enough joy that we can produce. Also, joy is one of the prerequisites for meditation. In the uh, transcendental, depend arising, joy comes before meditation. And that is the kind of joy that's not produced through the meditative path, but the joy in the heart. Now having joy with others multiplies joy many times and also obviously envy or pretense are unwholesome. One can easily find out how much joy with others one has if for instance somebody else gets a job one has wanted for oneself. Does one try to remain even-minded about it or does one actually have joy with that person that got it? Or, on a lesser scale, when somebody gets the last parking spot that we wanted and we feel that we were actually there ahead of that other person. It's something to practice. If we have children, how much joy do we have when they bring home a good report card? Wonderful. How much joy do we have when the neighbor's kid brings home a better report card? <laughs> so the practice of joy with others is very effective also to reduce our feeling of separateness. It is very effective to give us that feeling of togetherness, to make it real, to manifest it, not just to think it. Like we did in the element contemplation, that we feel that non-separation from ourselves to all that exists. When we actually start feeling that, joy with others becomes easier. It's another expression of impersonal love. Is it possible for you to sign your books for those of us who have brought well-worn copies with us 
to the retreat? If so, when? I'll be happy to sign books, well-worn or otherwise. <laughs> Anything, new ones, old ones. Saturday, after lunch, in the dining room. I'll have lunch in the dining room and I'll be happy to do that. So bring your books with you. And I'll be sure to bring a pen. <laughs> Did you say that the greedy procrastinator personality type would have most difficulty doing the jhanas? Would you please elaborate and help? No, I said exactly the opposite, if I said it at all. The uh, greedy type, as opposed to the hate type, can do loving-kindness much easier, of course, loving-kindness meditation, and also the jhanas. And the person that is of the greedy type, and I would like to say again, everybody's got both, only that some of us, have one more pronounced than the other. The greedy type is easier to live with, has an easier time living with him or herself, because he's always in good hope. (laughs) Something nice is bound to happen. The hate type is much harder to live with, much harder living with him or herself, but much more likely to continue the practice and really get into it because it's much more burning the hate type for the hate type so it's easier for the greed type to get into the jhanas but these are generalities some people might have exactly 50 50 and uh, some people might be of the greed type this year and the hate type next year (laughs) So these are generalities that we can't really use for the practice very well. But if we recognize ourselves in any of that, we may be able to um, counteract it a little more easily. Do you have to feel warmth and openness of the heart in order for metta practice to work? It's just conceptual for me. Yes, it often starts as a concept. And that's all right. We've got to start somewhere. If we have difficulty feeling the warmth and the openness of the heart, the more often we think it, the more easily we'll feel it. We've got to start with something. We can't expect that we will do it perfectly or even well right away. Some people might, and others might not. So the concept is, for most people, it's acceptable. For most people, it's not only acceptable, but it sounds like being desirable. So if we have a concept that's acceptable and desirable, use it. That's all one can say about it. Use it again and again not only in the meditation. This is a very important point. I have made already several times, and I repeat it. And I have no compunction about repeating myself any number of times, because the Buddha did too. He repeated himself any number of times. Why he did that? One would assume that he knew that while one hears him, one still doesn't quite take it in. So, In daily life, one has to practice. One has to practice this feeling in any situation, under any circumstances. But one should start, if it's difficult, one should start where it's easy. I was looking out of the window of my room, and three people came by and walked towards the zendo, and each one of the three stroked the cat very lovingly very pretty cat. I, by the way, tried to do it too, but she didn't have any time for me. She was cleaning herself. But when those people came, she had finished that. So they were able to stroke her. They were having love for this very pretty cat. Well, it's 
a start, isn't it? I'm not saying that these people didn't ha don't have love for other people, but at least it's something. <laughs> they certainly looked very loving when they were stroking this pretty cat. So start with the easy things, with little kids, with flowers, with cats, with beautiful cloud formations. And then go to the nice people, the ones that are easy to handle, those that smile at you. And then one day try out with the difficult ones. It's only when we actually can love the difficult ones that we have mastered it. But we don't have to master it right away. We can work at it. In meditation, I sometimes hear a sound like a Tibetan gong, a bowl, bowl, or electric wires that continues. This is when I'm in a blissful, empty state. When I listen to the sound, the state seems to deepen. Can you comment on any context for this in the jhanas and the right focus of attention? The sound is not actually happening, I assume from this, but it's just something that is heard inside. If that deepens the concentration and one can then remain or enter into the uh, delightful, blissful sensation and stay with that without being disturbed by sound, it's fine. Anything that helps the concentration. Just so that it doesn't become a disturbance or something that one has to rely on. Because that sound may not always be there, it says sometimes. So if it is there and deepens concentration and the delightful sensation is there, that's fine. Stay with the delightful or blissful sensation. <coughs> Study of scriptures I have seen listed as one possible impediment to insight. Can you comment on the role of studying the teachings through reading on this path? Any comments on balance between study and practice for us academic types? <laughs> there are these academic types. Well, the Buddha taught Parayati Pati Pati. Parayati is study, Patipati is practice, both. And Parayati, and I have already explained it this morning because I had looked at this question this morning. The study of the Buddha's discourses should not be an, just an automatic reading and having read, putting it away and saying, I finished with the Majjhima Nikaya. It's not that difficult to finish with the Majjhima Nikaya. Given enough time, one can read through it. Even though it's a fat one, it doesn't matter. But that isn't the way to do it. I've already explained to you this morning, I'll repeat it, that one uses it as a teaching device by trying to read, let's say, one page. If there isn't enough on that one page, read two. And then making notes in telegram style of the content of that one or two pages, then remembering that which was essential on those one or two pages, and then practicing that. Having practiced it for some time, getting the idea that one now doesn't have to look at that bit of paper anymore, but one can practice it over and over again, next page. That way it will take a long time to finish, for instance, the Majjhima Nikaya, but that doesn't matter. Time is not of the essence here. The inner feeling for the teaching and the actual practice is of the essence. So we can certainly balance it and not be academic about it but regard the study of the suttas, which are the most useful ones of the many, um, many scriptures that we have, 
regard that as a teaching. And if we have enough energy, willpower, and also inventiveness, everything that we could possibly want to know is contained in the suttas, but it takes a fair bit of doing to relate it to each other. Some friends say, why do you meditate? You're mentally stable. (laughs) I hope so. (laughs) Perhaps you can offer me some convincing dialogue (laughs) to respond. I don't think I've been convincing so far. (coughs) They just tolerate more of my unusual activities. Well, maybe you could tell these people that meditation is definitely not for the unstable. And maybe you can tell them that you are getting or searching for peace and joy in your heart without being dependent on outer conditions. I think that's a convincing sentence. (laughs) (laughs) You can try anyway. (laughs) When one is in severe, unavoidable physical pain, how can one access the absorptions? About 40 or so years ago, the venerable Chan Master Yun, when he was 115 years old or so, was severely beaten by Mao soldiers. Reportedly, he was able to enter deep samadhi and remain there for many days. So apparently it's possible. Does one have to be 115 and a great master of samadhi to do so? Well, I dare say one doesn't have to be 115. The Buddha did it when he was much younger than that. It was also in severe pain. But one has to be a master of samadhi, yes, of course. I don't think age enters into it. I can relate to purification of one's own mind and heart. However, is it possible to purify the collective minds of a society or culture? Can activities such as promoting social justice and eliminating social causes of poverty, homelessness, and racial discrimination help to improve the situations of individuals. Is there such a thing as group karma, and how does that affect individual karma? Well, there are several questions all together here. The first one is, is it possible to purify collective the collective minds of a society or culture? Well, the answer is obviously no, because if that had been possible, Jesus would have done it, Buddha would have done it, all the great masters would have done it, if such a thing is possible. All they can do is point their finger, their mind, in the right direction, and anyone who wants to follow the instructions is welcome to do so. So one cannot purify a whole society. One can purify oneself, and thereby the society has more purity. Can activities such as promoting social justice, eliminating social causes of poverty, homelessness, and racial discrimination help to improve the situation of individuals? Yes, certainly. But the main thing thereby to consider is the fact that helping others is one of the primary ways and primary causes for good karma. So if we are understanding that making good karma is a necessity for living a good life, then obviously we will try and help. And one day helping becomes so habitual that we don't even think about making good karma. We do it because it is the right thing, the one thing, the primary thing to do. So certainly we can help others and 
if we have a chance to do so, we should certainly try and do as much of it as we can. Is there such a thing as group karma, and how does that affect individual karma? No, it's the other way around. There is no group karma. But individuals that have lived together, for instance, might have made very similar karma, so that when they come again into this life, there is a certain group karma that one can observe. They're actually all still getting the results of their own causes. But since they're very similar and have been together before, we can see them as a group. I have an adult child who is unhappy, very driven, full of self-judgment, restless, dissatisfied. She has seen the benefits meditation has given me, but doesn't want to try it. Can you suggest any practices I can give her to make a bridge to meditation for her, or at least ease her suffering? Well, one of the things which happen in families over and over again, that a child will listen to an outsider much more easily, even a grown child, than to their own mother or father. So trying to impress that child with telling anything is usually not very successful. Especially if they, the child feels that there's pressure behind it. When there's pressure behind it, it doesn't work at all. However, a bridge, yes, a creativity, anything that would interest the child, painting possibly, any creativity makes a good bridge. Helping people, working with people, voluntary service, or even working with animals, voluntary service, all these are bridges, but no pressure. Maybe going there oneself and taking the child along. It's not an easy solution. Would you speak some more about the character types you mentioned? Would this information be useful in our mindfulness practices or in applying the Dhamma in our relations with others? Is there a book where this part of the Buddha's teaching is included? Well, yes, there is. It's called Pugala Panyati and it's out of the Abhidhamma. And uh, I don't know whether it's going to be very useful to read, but we can try. Pugala means people, and Panyati means character or types. It's one of the Abhidhamma books. Um, well, the information is useful if you can remember that the wor world is the way it is because we are born with three unwholesome roots and also three wholesome ones. But that it is a personal choice which one of the roots we foster, which ones we have any more uh, relationship to. Now the unwholesome ones are greed, hate and delusion. And we have, we have them. Everybody's got them. Delusion means that we think we're me. And greed and hate arise out of that. And Pali, Lopa, Dosa, Moha. Moha is the delusion. So if you can remember that everybody's got that, but is also endowed with the opposite, generosity and love and wisdom, then we have less opportunity and less wish to be judgmental. We've got it, the other person's got it, everybody's got it. And sometimes we manifest the wholesome ones, and sometimes we manifest the unwholesome ones. Hopefully we manifest the wholesome ones a little more often than the unwholesome ones, and so people can say, very nice person. 
if we manifest the unwholesome ones more often, well, then they'll say something else. So, but it does give us the opportunity to be more tolerant and accepting, especially if we've seen those roots within ourselves. Um, I don't believe that a closer uh, examination of character types would help one, but one can always try. The book is certainly available, and if you can't find it in the bookshop, you can always get it from the Polytech Society in England. That would be the application of the Dhamma in our relationship with other people, knowing those six roots and recognizing them in oneself and not being judgmental about oneself but compassionate. And then one can do the same with and for others. Are there different intensities of each jhana as there are different intensities of Piti. In other words, can I be in first jhana a little bit during one sitting and very deeply the next or not at all? Or is each jhana like a quantum state? It's there or it's not. And that's all there is to say about it. No, certainly not. It's uh, very likely that it has different intensities, especially at the beginning of that practice. Later on, when one has practiced that for a long time, it becomes so very much even. It's so ha uh, habitual that there is hardly any difference to be found in each sitting. The only difference that could be found in each sitting then would be the amount of mindfulness and awareness. However, in the beginning it can very easily be very mild, very strong, not at all, anything at all. And because of that, if there is a good and solid meditation has happened, then it's very important to recapitulate what have I done so that one can do it again. And as one does it again and again, it becomes a natural pathway for the mind. And it creates that even-minded joy and peacefulness, which is more difficult to shake than it has been in the past. It's still shakeable. Where is the dividing line between access, med concentration, accompanied by pleasant sensation, and first jhana, accompanied by applied and sustained and discursive thought. I think what has happened here, I'm not sure, but I think one of our academic types <laughs> has used the words and mixed them up. Because access concentration is not accompanied by pleasant sensation. It can be very much accompanied by drowsiness. It can be very much accompanied by lack of mindfulness and remains excess concentration. The first jhana is accompanied not by discursive thought, which is the wrong translation found in numbers of the dictionaries where vitaka and vichara are wrongly translated. They are translated as applied and sustained, which is correct, thought, but they're not thought. They are initial and sustained application of the mind, and they're certainly not discursive. When they're discursive, they don't work. So what we've got here is a mixture of words which are being used over and over again, but don't really hit the spot of the meaning of what is meant with the jhana. So, access concentration is something else than jhana. Access concentration feels as if one is on the breath. Although there is the awareness of the fact 
that there are nebulous thoughts going on in the background. Sometimes it feels as if those nebulous thoughts are going on the back of going on at the back of the head. Well, it's just a feeling. Um, they are nebulous. One can't pinpoint what they are. If one wants to pinpoint, the concentration disappears. So that's access concentration. One is almost there, but because one doesn't make a concerted effort to really get into the depth of the concentration, the whole thing is still on a superficial basis. Now the first jhana arises because of initial and sustained application to the meditation subject and then turns into piti. It can never be accompanied by thought. It, it's very often wrongly translated like that. Does concentration practice and reflection practice, I presume that's contemplation practice, huh? improve one's ability to create mental pictures? Did your strength of imagina imagination increase with your developing ability to do jhana? Do the reflections get easier? Everything gets easier, <laughs> particularly life. <laughs> if one is really on the spiritual path, there comes a moment when one realizes that one of the important features of a spiritual path is renunciation. Now, renunciation doesn't necessarily mean that one has to shave one's hair off, that one has to wear certain clothes or sit in a cave. Renunciation means letting go of all those things which are escape um, mechanisms from our dukkha. And because of renouncing those escape mechanisms, or at least some of them, there has to be a substitute. And the substitute are the jhanas. And uh, because of that, it becomes much easier to practice. There is a feeling of joy in the practice. There's a feeling of recognizing that the path is not stern and forbidding, but bringing a lot of ease. It even brings physical ease, because in the jhanas you don't feel the body. So not only contemplation becomes easier, it certainly does. Um, the creation of mental pictures is the um, possibility for people who are visually inclined. Some people aren't, some aren't. It isn't a necessity. One doesn't have to visualize. It's helpful, but one doesn't have to. So the jhanas do give... It's like putting oil in the works. It glides easier. There was a question that the person who put it didn't want to be read out about where to find the quotation I mentioned that the Buddha said the jhanas were uh, something desirable. And I have put the photocopy of that page of the Majjhinyanikaya outside there on top of the uh, question board so you can read it, what he said about the jhanas. It's out of the Majjhinyanikaya the new one that Wisdom has published, translated by Bhikkhu Nyanamuli and Bhikkhu Bodhi. I am confused by your advice yesterday against smiling here in this environment. Well, I don't know that I said don't smile. If you do a second jhana, you can't help but smile. 
avoiding eye contact, not smiling, keeping to a self-absorbed bubble. This describes the way most city dwellers live, and I don't want to live that way. For me, avoiding eye contact or not extending a helping hand or refraining from initiating a smile feels false and contrived. If love is indeed learnable, and if thoughts, words, deeds have immediate consequences, this it is, this is it exact, no, this is exactly, that this training of the heart that feels appropriate for this environment. We practice individually, but we're here collectively, supporting each other's practice. That's a rare and beautiful occurrence. Shouldn't our community be acknowledged and encouraged as well? Practicing mindfulness and wholesome choices, and then going out of the way to not acknowledge each other, seems like a contradiction to me. Am I missing something? The answer to that question would be yes. Um, I said, choose. Make a choice. If you want to initiate contact, it's up to you. We are not a police force. Whatever you choose to do, it's entirely up to you. I said that it's probably, um, not only probably, that it's um, the right thing to do, that if somebody initiates, that you acknowledge. But I suggested that you don't initiate the contact. If you wish to do so, by all means, do whatever you want. You're all here voluntarily. And the only thing that really counts in, an, in this environment at this time is your own personal development. And if you can only feel loving kindness and compassion, if you actually make contact with somebody else, well, so be it. Loving kindness and compassion do not need anybody that had, has to be given to. It's a quality of the heart. And it's always there once one has developed it. So if we develop it, and if it's necessary for the development to have that contact, then do it. But don't be surprised if somebody else does not acknowledge it. Maybe they want to actually practice to the point of intensity. It's quite possible. At the moment, we are not city dwellers. I have the impression that we're in the country. <laughs> and it's very nice. So when you get back to the city where one apparently lives, you can practice what you've learned here. The best way to learn it, that's up to each person. Would you explain the term karmic formation with regard to feelings that express dissatisfaction? And then there's a long list of dissatisfied feelings. All quite correct, they're all dissatisfied, annoyed and upset, uneasy and worried, anxious and fearful, sad and embarrassed, helpless and ashamed. So it goes on more. Uh, with right view, can we just dismiss these feelings when they arise as aberrations of our ignorance? How do we steer? Well, I don't know that we've talked about dismissing feelings. I can't remember ever, ever having used that word. I think what we've talked about has been substitution. Substitute with the opposite. So dismissal is something that is very difficult. And eventually one day we may come to the point where these sort of feelings do not arise. But in the beginning, and a long time into the beginning, we need to substitute. If we can't, if, we f if the feeling is very strong, the emotion, let's say, of um, anxiety, 
confusion or whatever, if it's very strong, we'll have to inquire into it. Why do I feel that way at this moment? Any answer is a new question. So the first thing is to try and substitute. The second thing is to try and find out. And if nothing works, I have suggested that we take an interim step. The interim step from the negative to the positive being that we put the mind on something which arouses a very positive feeling. Beautiful cat lovely roses, uh, clouds in the sky, the ocean, whatever. A cute little kid. Any interim step to get the mind and the emotions calmed down and then try again to substitute. It's helpful to inquire. Why? Why am I feeling that way? what's going on within me but this interim step is also very helpful on Sunday you were addressing the development of a love not dependent upon people or circumstances you said something like don't feel fall 